Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of my proposed British tank tech tree um, series. Now in this episode we're looking at the Commonwealth nations, um, Canada and Australia. I don't think any other Commonwealth nations built tanks unfortunately. Um, now the Commonwealth obviously contributed in you know many different ways during the war. Canada had one of the beaches on D-Day and um, was there, fight, there fighting alongside the British, French and Americans while in um, Northwest Europe. Um, the Australians did a lot of fighting in the deserts um, and against the Japanese in the Pacific, but they never really built many tanks. Yeah. Only two tanks that I know of um, were really produced by the Commonwealth. Um, South Africa and New Zealand might have produced some armoured personnel carrier type things or armoured cars, but the proper gun tanks were only really produced by Australia and Canada, as far as I'm aware. Um, and I'm now the reason I put them in this tech tree and not in their own is because there's only two of them. Um, there's a few different variants of them, but ultimately not really enough for its own tech tree. Um, there were other stuff made by the Australians in Canada. For example, the um, I think the Sexton was based on the on the Canadian tank, but um, there isn't really enough. You know, I'm not adding them in at the moment. Um, so for the moment I've put them with the British tech tree, if in the future they get more vehicles maybe they could go in their own tech tree. But I just thought I'd put them here because this is sort of the bare bones, what is basically needed for the British at the start. Um, so I think they should be good, quite good here until a decision is made on whether they get their own tech tree or not. Um, but before I ramble on too long, um, we'll get straight into the video. Now the first tank we're looking at is the Ram, um, the, or the cruiser tank Ram. Um, we're going to do all the variants of the Ram tank, and then we're going to do all the variants of the next tank. Because um, they're a bit split all over the place along the um, tech tree. So to stop us interrupting going to different tanks and all that, we'll just do the Canadian cruiser tank Mark One, Ram Mark One first. Now, um, when Canada entered into World War Two, I'm sort of quoting from my book a bit here, it didn't actually have any tank units. And the first Canadian tank training um, was done on old World War One tanks from America. From, yeah, American sources. Um, but it was not long before the Canadian railway industry was asked by the UK if it could manufacture and supply Valentine infantry tanks. Um, proved to be a major task for the Canadians who had virtually had to virtually build up a tank manufacturing capability from scratch. Um, like I said, quoting from my book, um, but the Valentines were infantry tanks and new cruiser t um, Canadian tank units would need cruisers for armoured combat. Um, little prospect to getting them from the UK. Um, the US wasn't involved in the war, so the only thing to do was design and build tanks in Canada. Um, like I said, I was quoting from my book mostly there. Um, but yeah, that's the sort of situation Canada was in. Couldn't get tanks from anywhere other than the UK, and the UK was obviously quite busy after Dunkirk, so they decided to build their own ones. Um, now they, I think, in the end, I'm trying to read it here. The Canadians decided to adopt the main mechanical hull and trans um, main mechanical hull and transmission components of the M3, but allied them to a new turret mounting a 75 mm gun. Um, this never actually happened, unfortunately. But um, the first tank, the Mark Ram Mark One, got a two pounder gun, a 40 mm weapon. Now, obviously, because it's a two pounder gun, I've put it in tier one, uh, with all the other two pounder tanks, really. Um, now the armour of the Ram Mark I, um, I'm trying to find it, was about 25 to 87 millimetres, so not too bad. Um, one of the weird things about this tank, it seems to have like a little second turret in the front of it, I don't know why it does, or at least in some of the early variants. Um, not entirely sure, like I said, not entirely sure why they did that. One of the reasons they didn't just adopt the M3 completely was because of the sponson, like mounted armament instead of turret mounted armament then they go and add something as archaic as a separate machine gun turret which you know looking at previous British tanks didn't particularly turn out too well um, secondary armament was um, three f f 7.62 millimeter machine guns um, could top speed of 25 miles an hour it doesn't say if that's um, off-road or on-road um, but after the Mark One, they obviously needed to upgrade it gun-wise, and they decided to upgrade it to a six-pounder gun. Now the six pound, there's two six-pounder guns here. We've got the Mark Three and the Mark Five. Now, from what I understand, the Mark Three was a shorter 
barrel of the Mark II. Well, it was a Mark tank version of the Mark II, but it had a shorter barrel, um, length 43. While the Mark V was a tank version of the Mark IV, which had a, le- a length 50 barrel. Um, admittedly, my knowledge of tank guns isn't great, but I'm pretty sure the longer the barrel, it's generally meant to have better penetrating power. So, obviously, this, um, you know, uh, the Mark V is a bit, should be a bit better than the Mark III. Um, now, the Mark III I've put tier 2, or um, well, the Mark II with the Mark III 6 pounder, I've put tier 2. While the Mark II with the Mark V 6 pounder, I've, I wasn't sure if to put it in tier 3 or tier 2. I've put it higher tier 2 for the moment, but um, it probably could go up a bit more if it needed to maybe I'm still sort of changing the tech trees about a little bit not entirely sure you know I've put it high tier 2 just to be on the safe side um, unfortunately the um, tanks were never used in combat because um, basically the M4 Sherman was now produced and it was coming off of the production lines and you know there was enough to equip all of the allied armies um, just quoting my book again thus the rams were used only for were used for train, training only. Um, as they were withdrawn, many had their turrets removed to produce the Ram Kangaroo, a simple yet efficient armoured personnel carrier, widely used in the post June 1944 campaigns. Um, some were used as light artillery observation posts. Um, some were put through experimental and trial purposes, I'm quoting here, such as mounting the mounting of a 94mm anti aircraft gun on top of the hull. Um, <laughs> Would have been would be nice to see that, but uh, unfortunately, I doubt we will. Um, and again, quoting the Ram's quite greatest contribution to the conflict was uh, the adaption of the basic ram hull to take a twenty-five pounder artillery piece, um, which became the sexton. Like I said, that could have probably been added in, but I wasn't sure about self-propelled um, guns really. So I like it seems more like a self-propelled artillery gun, and we don't really have them in War Thunder. So I've Kept it out of the tech tree. Um, seems like a decent enough tank. Only two variants, well, three if you count the different six pounder guns. But I think it would do relatively well, at least in the early tiers. I um, think it's a good candidate for being added into the game. Now, the next tank we're looking at is the cruiser tank Sentinel. Um, the AC1, the AC3, and the AC4. Um, I'll explain why there isn't an AC2 in a minute. Um, again, quoting from my book, Australia's armed forces had. Um, Virtually no modern tanks and lacked almost any form of heavy engineering background to produce them. Even an automobile industry was lacking. Um, this was at the beginning of the war, so obviously not very much time to learn how to do it. Um, the Australian government realised it was unlikely to get large amounts of heavy war materials um, from overseas, so set to produce their own. Requirement Among the requirements was tanks, and that since there was no le- local expertise on the subject, one engineer was sent to the United States, and an experienced engineer was obtained from the UK. So, they've only got two experts. They've got hardly any form of heavy engineering, or even an automobile industry, and they decided to set out to build tanks in 1939. Um, with this experience at to hand, the Australian Army issued a specification. Um and the Australian industry set to with a wheel. First tank design was known as the AC-1, Australian Cruiser 1, and was to have a two pounder gun and two 7.7mm machine guns. And it was decided to use as many components of the American M3 tank as possible. Uh, power, plant, po- power plant was to compromise three Cadillac car engines and ex- joined together and the extensive use was to be made of cast armour. Um, something that wasn't all that um, common then, I don't think. A second model to be known as the AC-2 was mooted, but by late 1941, as the Japanese became increasingly aggressive in the Pacific, the AC-2 was passed over in favour of the existing AC-1. Now, the armour, according to my book for the AC-1, was about um, 25 to 65 millimetres in thickness, um, which is weird, um, because if you go online, I've seen the armour being about from 65 on the whole and 45 at the rear of the hole, but 65mm all round on the turret, so a bit of confusion on the minimum armour, um, perhaps. Um, probably go with the book for the moment, because books generally tend to be a bit, bit more reliable, but, you know, just so you're aware of the discrepancy that possibly, that possibly exists. 
Now the first AC-1s were ready by January 1942 and that's when it was named the Sentinel. Um, the whole project, from paper work requests to hardware, had taken only 22 months. Remember they didn't have a tank industry or even an automobile industry and they had to rely on two experts in 1939 and it, they did that in just under two years. Um, you know, that's just amazing really. Um, and they had to design all the, according to the sets, all the facilities to build the tank had to be developed even as the tanks were being built. So they had to build the factories while they were building the tanks, so that's just amazing. Um, but only a few AC-1 tanks were produced, as by 1942 it was the two pounder gun would be too small to have any effect against other armour, and anyway the hurried design still had some bugs that had to be modified out of the design. Most of these bugs were only minor, for the Sentinel turned out to be a remarkably sound design, capable of consider considerable stretch modification. Um, I'm actually surprised about the two-pounder being considered not very good, uh, at least against the Japanese. Their armour was generally quite thin, so I don't know if this was expected to go to Europe at some point. Um, I'll have to look into that. So with the two-pounder gun being seen as inadequate, the Australians took the logical step and upgraded it to a 25-pounder gun. Yes, an 87.6mm field gun bar barrel in the turret to overcome the shortcomings of the two pounder they shoved, They decided a 40mm gun wasn't any good so they just doubled the calibre of the weapon in the turret because <laughs> I mean, when you think Britain used to go 40mm to 57 then to 70 and then Australia's just gone from 40 to 80 um, I'm not sure how well the 25 pounder was at actual anti-tank work I've heard they were used in the anti-tank role sometimes um, but I'm not sure how well they did in that role um, which is why I've put it um, tier 3, um, low tier 3, because I'm, you know, it could go to tier 2, it depends how good the gun is, I don't know, I don't know what it looks like, the 25 pounder gun either, I haven't been able to find any pictures. But um, the 25 pounder was chosen as it was already in production locally, but it was realised this gun would have only limited effect against armour, like I said, um, I don't know how, when it would be, against the Japanese it seems it would be quite useful, but um, the Sentinel AC-4 with a 17-pounder anti-tank gun was proposed and a prototype was built. This was during 1943, but, you know, the Jap by then the Japanese weren't going to invade Australia, and obviously it was a lot less rushed. Um, you know, they didn't have to get it into service so quickly. Um, sort of quoting here, the hurried introduction of the AC-1 into service had receded. Um, and again, like with the Canadians, M3s and M4s were coming off the production lines in such numbers that there would be more than enough to equip, to equip all the Allies, including Australia. Thus, Sentinel production came to an abrupt halt in July 1943 in order to allow the diversion of industrial potential to more important prototypes. The Sentinel series was a remarkable one, not only from the industrial side, but also from the design viewpoint. The, the use of an all-cast hull was way ahead of design practice elsewhere, and the ready acceptance of heavy guns like the 25-pounder and the 17-pounder was also way ahead of contemporary fault. Um, but the Sentinel series had little impact at the time for the examples produced or used for training only. Which I think is quite sad. They made this really good tank well ahead of many other nations and it was just never used because uh, logistical reasons and, you know, production. Uh, it was kind of sad. I mean, the Ram was a good tank, but... I think the Sentinel does have a like, sort of special place, well not special place, but you know, I do admire the fact they managed to build that in 22 months from design to building, and then upgrade it to such good guns, um, it's just amazing, um, I forgot to mention it earlier, it could also do 30 miles an hour, so faster than the Ram, um, yeah, it's a very good tank, um, and it's kind of a shame it was never used in combat, unfortunately. Now, for the tech tree, um, I've put the um, Sentinel, or the AC-4 Sentinel at tier 4, because it's a 17-pounder gun, um, that's going to be quite powerful. Um, it's got decent armour, um, it seems to have a good speed, um, I think it'll do very well there, um, in that tier. Um, that's the highest tier Commonwealth vehicle in my list, um, and I think it would be a great addition to the game, and, you know, show people the contributions that the Canadians and Australians and other Commonwealth nations made, um, even if it wasn't necessarily through production of tanks um, and such. Um, but yeah, I think they would. All of these tanks would be a very good addition to the 
um, tech tree, or the British tech tree, or War Thunder in general. Now the video actually went on for a bit longer than I expected, or quite a bit longer, but um, I wanted to sort of go into detail on these tanks, because um, they are sort of the tanks that don't really get remembered, unfortunately, because they were never used in combat, um, and never produced in very large numbers. Um, the ram sometimes gets noticed because of the it was used in other roles, you know, as the sexton, as the ram kangaroo, the um, sentinel. I hadn't heard of it until I bought this um, book years ago. I just had no idea they'd even bothered building a tank. Um, so I hope um, this gives you an idea of what Commonwealth tanks could be added into the game. I hope it gives you an idea of what Commonwealth tanks were designed and built, if ultimately not used during the war. I um, hope you've enjoyed the episode. Um, leave a like if you like the videos, um, subscribe if you like watching these sorts of videos, uh, leave feedback um, or information, you could always do with more feedback and I, you know, if I've got something wrong and you want to correct me then feel free to put it in the comments. Um, yeah, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.